Hello and welcome to the Photography Bar podcast. Before we get to the main episode, I just wanted to give a bit of a shout out to our lovely patrons. So that's Amara Zainab, Carl Shervel, Nick Payne and Rob Percy. Thank you ever so much for your support. It really does mean a lot and it does help us to keep bringing this content out to you. If anybody else wants to uh, help and support our show, then please check on our patron site. Here's the episode. Okay, Mark, how are you? I'm okay, thank you very much. And how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. And we've got a, a special guest presenter with us, uh, Scarlett Page. Scarlett, thank you for joining us. Pleasure, thanks for asking. And sitting in the bar with us as well, as you can yeah, all see. So, <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Okay, so guys, I want to jump uh, straight into this. And I want to talk something about something and just get your thoughts on this, which is it's non-photography related. Okay, but... Uh, but um, a client of mine contacted me in the week and it just made me think about something. And I thought I'd very quickly, just for two or three minutes, just get your opinions on this. Okay. And I'm just going to read this because I actually, I actually looked, I actually looked it up a little bit and it says that a new survey finds that the majority of British employees support the idea of a right to switch off law that would allow them to ignore work emails while they're on holiday. New research conducted by B2B services uh, has found that the majority of working Brits, 67%, feel under pressure to check their company emails when they're on holiday. And the poll of 2,000 UK employees also found that 66% of workers would support the introduction to the right to switch off. Uh, and it's a law that they've already got in place in France. And uh, it goes on to say that those who don't look at their work emails, and think about yourselves here, <laughs> those who don't look at their work emails are more likely to feel they've switched off in less than 24 hours when on holiday. However, it says that it takes the average person six days to switch off completely when they're on holiday. So yeah. do you guys look at your, do you take your laptop with you when you're on holiday? Scarlett, uh, you're, you guys yeah. say. <laughs> uh, generally, most of the time, yes, because I'm always worried mm -hmm. that someone's going to want something and then I'm going to feel the dread and the fear that I can't deliver. Um, <clears throat> but I just went away for five days and I didn't take my laptop, but I put an out of office or so I thought. And I am I do think it is really important to switch off because I think we're so connected. Everybody, you know, expects you to get back to them at the weekend or late at night, you know example I had a, a zoom that was cancelled earlier on today and they were like I can do it tonight I'm like I don't want to do it tonight you know you have mm -hmm. to have boundaries don't you sometimes mm -hmm. and because we're all working so much harder all the time I think it is important to to take time off even at the weekends you know controversial yeah. um <laughs> I did lose a job over it yeah when I Barcelona because I don't know if my out of office was working by the time I caught up they went oh we've employed someone else so I was like oh well I don't think they came to me first anyway so I don't think it was like I completely yeah oh, I mean, that's, yeah I, I guess it's the fear isn't it and and the reason why this uh, I, I brought this up because I was talking to probably my biggest client actually this was last week and this was on this would have been on Wednesday and uh, he, we needed to do a quick video call. And um, he said, I'm going away uh, on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock because I suggested Thursday morning. And he said, I'm going away on Thursday. I'm going at 11. I'm going to Austria with my wife and, and my daughter. And uh, he said, how about Friday morning? And I thought, you're, you're, you're going to be in Austria for the weekend. And I just I said to Martin, do you want to, uh, um, should we do it when you get back? Because it's it, it's not that urgent. And he said, no, if you're absolutely sure, that, that's fine. Um, and it just made me think that uh, I was sort of imposing, as it were, you know, but he was prepared to, to, to do a video call while he was away for a weekend or something. Now, in France, Italy and Spain, they do have this. They do have this law, this right to switch off law. And it goes back to 2017. It says which bans employers from expecting their employees to engage in communications such as emails outside of working hours. 
The Philippines, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Slovakia, Ireland, and Portugal have all followed suit since. And it it's goes a bit to different, you... though, Cam, that um, we're all self-employed. Hmm. I mean, uh, I, I can't imagine this law that you're putting in here would really affect us because we're self-employed. We are our own bosses. So it's just a bit different, is it not? Well, we don't work for the local council because then that's well, who no. it would apply for, wouldn't <laughs> it? You know, but, it, you know, um, there's this but thing now from... that... I, Sorry, I was going to say, you know, even though we're self-employed, it's sort of worse because what will happen is you will have done a shoot like, I don't know, a month ago and someone hasn't chosen their edit and then yeah. they're going to need them the day, you you know, the day after you go away and they're going to need them by tomorrow because everyone thinks they can get it so quickly. Yeah. So that is, that's the nightmare. If it's someone really important, a really important client, yeah. um, you know, you can send out. I think as long as communication is good, that's that's what I would do. I'd put, and I'm also setting up a whole NAS system whereby all my rules are going to be in one place, and then I can access them. So to you can access them when you're on holiday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully not. But then I I could even yeah. uh, my assistant could log into it, say, and I could yeah. go well, yeah. go to such and such folder, and you'll find, you know, so yeah. Hmm. Well, this is the crazy thing, because just sort of we did not want to talk too long about this. But, um, you know, recently someone had said to me that if you get for a wedding photography, if you get an inquiry for a wedding, you need to reply back to that inquiry within 10 minutes while it's still very hot. And they're in that moment of thinking about it. How crazy is that? Have we got to this point where hmm. we are so under stress and very briefly, because yeah, things keep coming up here, going back a good few years ago, uh, I was doing some work for a company. Uh, not too far from about an hour away. And there was a guy who I met there who was working with from Italy. And I, we just got chatting. And I guess he hadn't been in this country for too long because his English wasn't great. And he said to me that he was here for a three-year contract and he'd been here so far for six months in the UK. It's going back a few years ago. And he said, and I said, are you enjoying it here? Just through making conversation. And he said, not really. It's not good for my health. He goes, I love the job. But he said, life is so stressful in the UK compared to Italy. He said, we do have a lunch hour, but we don't, not really, because everyone has a sandwich while they're working. He said, going out in the evening, and it's stressful going out because you have to finish your drinks by 11 o'clock. And he said, even socialising is stressful in this country. So he said, it's no good for my health. <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, I still remember that conversation. So, well, it's, it's it's the... yeah, Sorry, sorry. No, Matt. no, carry on, carry on, Scarlett. Okay. I was going to say, it's interesting, and I think you're right about the getting back to someone in 10 minutes. I really you know now that you've said it it does make sense i think it has got a bit like that mm. but we don't want to be you know especially if you've got kids which i do and one's 13 and one's 16 and they're talking about um bringing in a bill whereby kids can't have social media till they're 16 which i'd be all for but then i've yeah. missed out that you know because actually my kids will have spent that whole time on you know where it is restricted but the thing is if you give that accept that example where you're always on you're always checking you know what does that yeah, yeah. say as well well it's learned right. behavior as well in that respect isn't it because we're always on our phone so it's hard to tell our children no you can't be on yours um it, yeah it is tricky and again let's just go back to the, the self-employed part i think it's always going to be more difficult for us on in that area because I think if you are employed by someone, you should be able to just tell the boss, no, yeah, you're not emailing me at this point because I'm on holiday. But I guess with self-employment, it's, it's just a bit more tricky to get around that, isn't it? So, guys, I don't know about you. Well, Mark, I know about you and your route into the industry. Um, mm. You went to university. I did. I didn't go into university. Um, Scarlett, how about yourself? Your route into photography, very briefly. What was that? Did you did you study photography at university? Did you? Yeah, I did. A, I did a art foundation course and really loved photography, even more so at that point. And then actually, my tutor was doing a part time degree at um, University of Westminster, and he sort of encouraged me to sort of go for that course, which was a photo arts course. So I did a three year degree. And then after that, I started assisting someone. Um, so, yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and the reason why I brought this up was um, a listener of ours. I, I won't mention his name, but it's a regular listener of ours. Um, sent us uh, a message going back a couple of weeks ago. And I said, I will respond to you. And uh, and um, 
Uh, I said, but just give me a couple of weeks. And then this was <laughs> and you have any yet, have you, Cam? Is that what right, we're saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah right. So, <laughs> but no, I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk. And it was and it was ideal to get Scott on for something like this. And now I'm not going to give his name away, but he's currently in the army and he's going to be leaving. And he he's older. I don't know how old he is, but he said, because of my age, it's going to be, it's not really for a young person. And I, I really want to get into film and, uh, and it's like filming photography and what is the best route? Because he was aware that Mark and I have had different different routes into photography. And I said, give me give me a bit of time and I'll, I'll have a look and to see. But, do you know, I've come to a bit, I've hit a bit of a brick wall as to what, what to suggest to him. Because we've spoken about this before, Mark, and uh, I went back to an article, uh, Scarlett. This came out, I think it was autumn uh, 2023. But it says here that the average university degree leaves graduates with a £45,000 debt in which they only start paying off their salary uh, when it exceeds £27,295. And um, it it gives a list of degrees that are the worst value for money. And these degrees uh, within the top 10, you've got things like tourism management, fashion, film, music, fine art, criminology, translation. However, (laughs) Can you guess what would be top? What, well, at well, the bottom? <laughs> bottom. <laughs> okay, yeah. Very much at the bottom, yeah. yeah. It's photography, okay? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's it's photography, which is really sad. It says the, the degrees that are the worst value for money in 2023, it's photography uh, is, is at the top of the list, and you've got translation, criminology, fine art, and then public administration and music. Your average salary five years after graduation at the moment for photography is £24,242. And we've spoken about a little bit about this before, but mm. it's it, it's it the thing is, is is university essential for photography? I guess really that's what the question that I'm asking at this point. I mean, I don't Mark? think it is. I don't think it is. Um mm-hmm. I mean, I went to university. I went in a time when I think uh, fees had just started. So it was only £3,000 a semester rather than the £9,000 it is now. So um, so at the end of it, it cost me £9,000. It's costing lots more these days. So would I go to uni now to study photography? I don't know. Um, I would be probably looking more into things like apprenticeship uh, and you know, just learning whilst you're earning, I guess. Um, that would be probably what I would do now having said that um you know I think this is what we spoke about before university is more than just learning your your what what is you're studying it's also learning about life it's about becoming an adult and you know that that kind of bridge you're kind of leaving your parents but there's still a safety net there and you're kind of learning how to cook for yourself properly and you know all that kind of stuff um but yeah, it's expensive now. It's really expensive. I think as well. I mean, there's a lot of terms um, that people are, are saying, like it's a Mickey Mouse degree and all that kind of stuff, which I find a little harsh because that's I that's what the headline hard. said. Yeah, I know. Well, the, the, I, the headline I, I worked, said Mickey Mouse degrees. I worked hard for my degrees, and it wasn't Mickey Mouse. Um, but I can understand the you know the how much you pay into it now. Is it worth doing? That's an argument to have. But to call it Mickey Mouse, I think it's a bit out of order, really. I mean, any so, thoughts what do you, you know do, looking back do you think that that was the right route for you and would, and would you suggest that now to somebody else so it was it your age when you went to uni um so i think i did it pre-fees actually um so mm, right, and, yeah. you know i remember my hall of residence was wasn't that expensive and so i was one of the lucky ones but i think Looking back at my degree, I think the things I got out of it were playing around in the darkroom. Um, mm. learn, I mean, obviously, it was film only when I was at uni. So, um, you know, using all different formats of cameras, which mm. I've only ever used medium format and DSLR, well, SLR. Mm. Um I've never had to do any large format. So that was, you know, interesting. I didn't learn that much about doing it in the real world, but I suppose I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So in that same respect, you know, I was experimenting and, you know, growing up and um, 
you know, I definitely once once you get a chance to, when I was assisting, that's when I started learning the real life practicalities of how to get stuff done. And it was a world apart from what I was doing at uni. Yeah. You know, there was nothing at uni that apart from loading film backs yeah. and being competent and understanding equipment. Mm. That was all. And but really, would it would I, I need to spend three years learning that? Probably not. And mine was um half theory and half practical. So there was a lot of, you know, rhetoric and ideology and yeah. uh, which actually ha isn't something I've really brought into my photography. But and I know other people who have. So um oh it's a tricky one i think it is. um yeah i think uh so like my daughter's going to go and do uh, a diploma in art and i would you know i don't know whether she would end up going to university i think she would probably better i think i probably would encourage a placement or a apprenticeship even if you're not getting paid but just, mm. you know, sometimes, because even when you leave uni, you're still in that same situation where you have to do that anyway to get yeah. your foot in the door, or show that you are competent or you're willing and you've got the enthusiasm and the passion. I think the only thing that um, uni might do is just, I'm really talking very generally mm. here, but I think mm -hmm. there is a generation that are quite distracted and maybe don't have the same work ethic as maybe previous generations yeah um definitely I am really you our, so, sorry i was gonna know. say our parents probably said the same about us though scarlett so but you're right i do yeah, agree with you. <laughs> but, you know you, i i have spoken to some students who are incredibly passionate and it is their world and that's all they want to do and you can see you're like god you've got it just oozing out of you and you are going to do well because that's all you want to do it's like that is it you don't want to be distracted by going on tiktok particularly you just want to mm. create and make and you love it but then there's other people and you think well i can't see that in you yeah. so you know you may have other skills you may be more practical you may be a brilliant assistant you know but even those things being switched on it's it's you know you either have it or you don't as well mm. Yeah, yeah no. and then that that moves on quite well to the next thing, sort of because in that you're talking about creatives, and again, it's something that we brought up a little while ago, Mark, where it was um, uh, is it eighty percent of photography businesses that start up fail in the first three years? Was that the fact, Mark? Was that yes, it was. It was around yeah. that. I think we're power phrasing a little bit because it was a few episodes ago. But um, yes, yeah. I think the idea. What I mean, I think what we were discussing is that people go straight from you to starting their own business and some of those people will succeed of course but mm. um i mean i worked at venture for a bit after after uni which uh, we've all heard about and that's where uh, basically similar story to what you were saying scarlett that's when i learned how to be a professional photographer um it certainly wasn't through uni um and then i, I went and went off on my own because i learned mm. the industry i was in uh and, not, so not we... mastered it obviously but you know just <laughs> but you're up to a point where you're confident enough to go off and do it yeah. And the other reason why I brought that up was because, again, it's, it was something that I, I'd, I'd read recently about creatives and academics. And it was saying that, you know, that, that our creative people, people in the creative industries, you know, uh, academically as gifted, and which I thought was a bit too broad of a statement. Um, but I have heard many times where I've heard people say, you know, I was never academic. I was, I was always a creative type. It was that's what I wanted to do. Scarlett, as you said, some people have just got a passion and a drive for it. And that's all they're going to do. That's all they can actually think about. Um, but then but they, came could across... be, they could be the people that are, you know, neurodiverse and they just I just that's you know they're not thinking of like the business model and you yeah. know being organized they just are loving you know that dopamine hit that you get when you do a shoot and mm. you know thinking about the next one and actually sort of thinking about oh i've got to find money for this and photography is an expensive profession let alone hobby you know it's yeah. um but you've got to make it work but you know i, I also came from a time where I was just getting employed by magazines. I didn't have to have like, you know, a studio management system or booking mm. forms. And, like that. and that's something that I've had to start looking at now. Like, Oh, what a bore, you know, it's not. So I think actually teaching that side of things at, at uni would be really useful. I know they do, but yeah, 
it's um that's it it's, it's quite rare that you have someone who's brilliant at all the things you know mm. and I mean, Scarlett, just... how was it how was it that when obviously you left uni um and then obviously you said you were you went sort of an apprenticeship and then you got your name out there how how did you get how how were those steps for you how did you get to that point well it was a really different time um mm. so i was um making sort of composite cards and sending them out to people I'd met. And so I work in the music business and I was sending them to like managers and press offices and record companies and, um, and then getting appointments to go in with my portfolio. Um, I had some images that were syndicated that were used on magazines. And then I was able to sort of put my foot in the door there. I think all that is a lot harder now just to sort of, you know, people don't pick up the phone and make an appointment so much. But mm. that face-to-face -face meeting is definitely still really important if you can get it. Um, things snowballed quite organically for me, and I was very lucky, you know, taking pictures of the right people at the right time. And um, then that sort of people taking note of that, you know, and mm. then sort of moving on to the next thing. But there is an element of i've been doing it for 30 years and it's not always been easy it's definitely had its moments and the transition to digital as well has been like you know you have to keep changing and evolving mm. so it's a constant learning game actually well, i'm guessing social media as well has changed that element to it your, your your portfolio is online now isn't it i mean anyone can see it but so is everybody else's i guess so yes. it's, it's hard to get like you were saying that that face-to-face -face meeting that kind of captive audience um it's, 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 to, it's more difficult these times yeah scott you could probably relate to it but i used to have my you know my black portfolio case you know and yeah and uh had the, the plastic wallets in there and 16 by 12s and i'd have the brochures that are shot images in and 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 you had to go and meet people face to face that's what we were just saying but now you don't really do that and i don't think that helps the confidence of photographers either because everything's done like this it's done via computers or you know, uh, so you, sometimes you're not seeing people face to face. And, you know, I can look back and think the number of times I've sat out some, outside somebody's office thinking I'm, I'm I'm going in next. and I've got my portfolio, my leg was shaking and, you know, you know, going through that experience. I don't know whether people are going through that now. As well, much. You, know, you know how um, we're all so saturated in the messages that we get and replying to people. Sometimes you miss something or you don't get back to them straight away. Well, mm. similarly, you might send an, an email to a, a picture editor at somewhere at a newspaper or wherever, and they don't get back to you. So for a new up and coming photographer, that's really disheartening. It's like they don't have the, the guts to sort of send another message. But I would say you have to find a way whether you go, oh, I've been having some trouble with my email. I just wanted to check you received this or, mm -hmm. you know, you come up with some cheesy excuse to send the same email again and go, hello, because it is sometimes just the right message at the right time or someone who has the time and space to sort of, you know, read what you're saying and actually go, oh, that would fit with this, actually, that we were talking about this morning. Bingo. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's that whole thing about being ghosted, isn't it? So I, I guess that's the term for it these days. That, uh, and then and it's not I think, on purpose. We just, you know, we just can't cope with everything that's going on, you know, and nor can yeah. they. They're working so much harder as we all are. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And going back to that whole sort of creative academic you know, why one of the reasons why business, so many photography businesses have failed in, in, in sort of the official stats. I think those things, uh, it's not so much about academic, but it is learning how a business works. You're going to get some incredible photographers that, that don't make it purely because they've just not had that business experience with anyone. They've not had that chance to, you know, I'd learned for years working with so many different photographers. I was fortunate. It was a different time. That was 30, 35 years ago, Scarlett, you know, um, where it was, there were so many jobs in the photography industry, you know, um, and and working for so many different photographers was really the way I got experience and see how they ran as businesses as well, you know, and finding out that out. And that's now harder than ever than ever to do, you know, um, for people to because most people it's very entrepreneurial now. You know, people want to just set up their own business straight away without trying to get some experience from somewhere. Um, but um, it's a difficult it's a difficult one to answer because we get these questions asked oh, so many times what's my best route into the industry and it's it's all and, it, and it's constantly changing it's never ending so but uh, mm. uh well, good to get your 
yeah, in the sorry. music business as well, you know, that particular strand of photography, um, you have a lot of, you know, recent graduates who are just so thrilled to be asked to do something that they're not asking for a fee, mm. you know, and, and it's like, well, ha it's it's really difficult because you have to do stuff to move forward, but you can't always guarantee that there are going to be the returns. And my experience would be that all the favours that I've done for people haven't ever really translated. Mm, yeah. Well, as it's it, we've all forgotten. had it, haven't we? Yeah. So we've all had that conversation with somebody. We've got a job, yeah, but it's be great for your portfolio, won't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. really yeah. great for your profile. Love or yeah. thanks. My profile's yeah. pretty good, right? <laughs> I guarantee you're going to get loads of orders from everyone. I don't, I don't think so. How different is it now? Uh, you know, are you still? Do you still see those those? That that I guess I guess demand for your services in the industry now compared to back when. Okay. And yeah, so I think I think that uh, people will still ask me to do something, and then it's a bit like, oh, if you'd like to come and shoot it, and I'm like, mm, but mm. Uh, just for my own fun, like it's my yeah. hobby, or <laughs> what we do right here, it's still quite hard to get that. Um, to get paid for certain things but um also even though you're you've you've got uh you know you're known in that industry now do you know what I mean? they, either, they either think oh she's going to be too expensive or you know and and i'm not i would say i'm com competitively priced because you have to be yeah uh, i think there are you know also some photographers that come to the to the the pot and they are all singing and all dancing so they are doing a bit of analog and digital and making some film all in one hello yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. that's i think you know that's great but at the same time all the way through this journey i've tried to stay um sort of consistent to what i do you know so mm. i've always when things all got a bit gimmicky and everyone was getting very photoshoppy with images, I was like, oh, I'm not really down with that. You'd have to fulfill brief sometimes, but I'm like, I know what I want to do. So I just carry on doing what I do. I'm not ever going to be a videographer. So I just, I can't offer that. It's like, you know, you do get asked, but it's, it's not what I do. It's not what I've always yeah. done. I am really good at what I do. I believe that. And mm -hmm you employ me but it's sometimes I get employed to do things and you think do you know what I do not really like you're just employing a photographer and it doesn't matter who it is but yeah. I think some photographers are better suited to certain things like you know I have a sensitivity and I'm good at working with difficult people and I like sort of doing that sort of fly on the wall where you can get access where other people might not because people can trust me and you mm. know catching a mm. real sort of like something that maybe not everyone could get and sort of gaining trust and you know those are the things or sort of taking portraits of people very quickly and trying to sort of go beyond that outer shell and those are the things that I feel when I look back over my work that's something that sort of shines through but mm. I won't be able to make you a TikTok while I'm doing it <laughs> yeah fair enough, think, fair enough. yeah and that's it, that's that's interesting that you're sort of saying that you've that you've made that conscious effort to really stick with your principles really haven't you and it's for me it's been sort of it's been a bit of both really because I you were talking about the going from the change from film to digital I mean I I remember when I first went to digital like properly that was 2009 moving from film to digital was like the most uncomfortable. Yeah. And that was quite feeling. late. Yeah. You, that's I, I always felt I was like I one of the I last ones. Late. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was 2009 when I did it and I, and I was desperate to go back to film because I didn't feel comfortable shooting digital, you know, and, um, and then come to, and, and I lost a ton of commercial clients because of that, because, we had people in company starting to say, oh, well, somebody else does it now. We can do it ourselves. People weren't ordering 110 by 8s or 210 by 8s from a product shot that we did because they were now being able to email it. And so I had to sort of reinvent. And then it was weddings that got kept me going and then it then went back to commercial. And then I started doing video as well in 2015. So I've had to constantly reinvent myself to stay within yeah. the industry, you know, and and you have your principles. I've had those and I've, they're still there, but I've also had to adapt as well, you know, and, and yeah. constantly come on to doing new stuff as well, you know, but it's been great. It's been a good ride as well. <laughs> well the 
this is it it's not you know it, it is actually I do enjoy learning um maybe not video but who knows you know never say never to anything but um it, yeah I do enjoy but you you know we've all had to become brilliant retouchers and you know good at social media and and understanding sort of computer programs that you know you sort of, <laughs> sort of have to have like a degree in all these different things um and and that is yeah marketing and you know it's yeah. it's you know back in the day it was literally you went and did a shoot you took it to the lab and and then the client would pick some prints you'd have them printed and it's, it was just a case of getting a courier to or you'd yeah. go to the lab and you know a test strip right, or yeah. whatever mm. and that was it that was yeah. it <laughs> um, you know yeah more now admin, it feels as and yeah, now it feels like you're shooting something for a client, but it's also what are you going to do with those images to gain something from it as well? Mm. You know, it's uh, so it's really, but it's a conversation that could go on and, you know, we could talk about it for, for you know, for, for days, but that's where it's difficult for the the, the listener that, that sent this message in to give really the right advice because it's so varied and you have to be so skilled. But um, yeah. if but, I may, yeah, but, um, just yeah. before we move on, because there was something that you said earlier, Scarlett, that um, I just wanted to sort of ask you about a little bit when you were talking about the skills that you have you know you're a photographer you, you're good at what you do and you were talking about your interpersonal skills basically you know how to deal with difficult people and, and all that kind of stuff how did you first off how did you know that you had a skill for that and secondly how did you how do you develop that skill because for me I, I I do weddings I do families and it, you, one of my skills, I, I I feel the same. I feel I have to deal with, you know, two-year-olds. I have to relate to a 90-year-old. I have to do all those sorts of things. But I felt I learned that sort of on my own back. I moved, obviously, going back to uni and all that kind of stuff. How did you develop that for yourself, do you think? I think uh, you have a certain personality. And, you know, that's sort of from, uh, you know, everything that you've learned and lived, it brings you to this place. And some mm. people more sensitive and some people are you know more sort of um bullshy and you know uh, like you know I, I think I didn't realize it's only sort of on reflection that you start sort of seeing a bit of a pattern in your work so I didn't go into it sort of thinking oh this is what I want to do but it's like well that's clearly what I do um and it, it's quite a difficult one to sort of put into words because it's more of a it's like a sort of chemistry thing. So for me, if I, you know, if I'm doing a shoot, um, it's, I don't like to sort of doing, I have a plan of what I'm doing, but then it's about sort of what you sort of work together, don't you? Somehow it's sort of, you can't really say, right, well, firstly, I'm going to ask them this and then we're going to do this. And it doesn't really work like that. It is very much a sort of, um, and that's where I, get a lot of joy out of it as well like you know I know I'm going to a certain location but I don't always know what I'm going to do there so when I get mm. there I'll talk to them and then you obviously have to do a certain amount of talking to relax them because a lot of people really hate having their photo taken or you need yep. to gain their trust somehow so you're sort of talking to them talking about a bit of rubbish sometimes mm -hmm. you some things for a reaction sometimes you say the opposite to you know sometimes I say I look really serious now and then they sort of lighten up and you're like well that's great because that's what I want actually I don't want the serious but you sort of just play around a little bit without mm -hmm. being too in their face and yeah that's it I, it's um there's no real formula but it's definitely I think I go into every shoot thinking no one wants to be here that long and they want it to be quite quick mm -hmm. um yeah and I hate it and I feel their pain sometimes when you can tell they're feeling quite, you know, this is not necessarily musicians because obviously they know how to pose and they're used to doing it all the time. Yeah. But even with them, you know, sometimes they're posing with their posy face and that's not the face that I want. Mm -hmm. I, guess I want off guard. So it's sort of trying to get that somehow by having conversation Mm. yeah but it's you were just sort of saying about how people feel uncomfortable in front of the camera and but let's flip it the other way has there been a time when you have felt uncomfortable behind the camera where you you felt sort of out of your comfort zone um when you're thinking i don't quite know what i'm going to do here uh more sort of having the guts to jump in on a situation or sort of 
you know, not knowing whether I should go into a dressing room as a band of come off stage because I want to give them a bit of space. And it's sort of those things that would hold me back a little bit. And then, you know, I think I walked past someone yesterday, actually in Caversham, near the yeah. Gorge, <laughs> if you know. <laughs> um, and there was a guy sitting outside in the sun reading a book, and I thought, oh, I wish I had a camera. You know, so there's, yeah. there's times sometimes where I think, oh, I've missed a, I missed a moment. But, um, yeah, I think... I don't know. I mean, most of the time, you know, I'm commissioned and I know, you know, everyone knows I'm doing a thing. I think that's the thing. Recently, I've been doing a bit more street photography, um, which is sort of pushing me out of my comfort zone because I don't, that's not an official arrangement. So you're having to approach someone and say, you know, would you mind if, and it's, you know, introduce yourself yeah. quickly, gain their trust. That's quite hard. And that's mm. something that's still. I think that's but the then, hardest thing. That, yeah, yeah, I've I said think that it to is. people who like doing street photography. So don't be the one that hides behind. Don't let the camera become a barrier between you and the subject. You go and talk to most people in the street and said, look, and you introduced yourself, you're doing some photography. I can guarantee you that 95% of people would say, hey, look, you know what? What would you like me to do? Uh, that And that's yeah, the I, hardest thing. It's that breaking that, that it's having that conversation rather than sort of invading their space and shooting without them telling them really. I think sometimes I think you're like a charity seller and they're like, well, what do I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah all that all the time like what you're you're after something um yeah. like, no i'm really not i'm just yeah. uh, but you sort of have to say oh i'm just uh i'm just a photographer <laughs> <And> <laughs> years but i don't do photography and i'm just trying to do this thing or like you know uh, do you mind yeah. if I do this? and well, um, you... but here's it's a, here's a question for both of you if i may if i may um cam do you like having your picture taken uh no i don't and and, and you know <laughs> No, I, I hate it too. Um, yeah. So I, I think, I mean, just going back to, again, you, you want that, you know, the, they generally want the shoot to be over quickly and stuff. I, I feel the same way. And I think having that empathy with that it really does help. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just sort of uh, the way I shoot would be, and I'm sure you're probably the same as like, you know, don't spend too long setting it all up. You know, I have to be quite mm. sort of, um, uh flexible and um simple really with you know mm. lighting and everything it works and i know what i'm you know i know what works and i've got to be ready to do things quickly and capture quickly yeah, um, yeah. i'm always conscious of how long i'm with a client i want to get it done as quickly as possible yeah, people yeah. just don't seem to want you there really do they no they always <laughs> a bit like oh there's the photographer like so if i'm doing yeah. or something they're like they come in and you're like, oh, it's really not as bad as you feel it's going to be. You know, I promise we get it done quickly. I know. Too I think I, and I'm at the point now, with, like you guys have been doing it for such a long time. I'll just go in now. I've got the confidence to be able to say, this is what I want to do. This is what we're going to do. Let's just get it done. And then you're out of there. But for mm. a lot of younger people, that's not really, they don't, they need to build that confidence, don't they? And it takes, and it can take years to get to that point. Well, that's going back to what we were saying at the beginning, wasn't it? You know, working mm. as an apprentice, working with a photographer, um that's how you get that i guess you get the knowledge and then with that confidence otherwise you're having that knowledge then gives you that confidence i guess well i think that's the downside to now and again scarlet something what you said earlier on about people's work ethic i think people now expect that it's an instant everything's instant the success is going to be instant you know there, there is no patience there's no i've got to learn this craft i've got i'll get there at some point but it's not it's set up a website got my instagram page hey i'm good to go and life isn't that isn't that easy is it as we know <laughs> maybe okay yeah. <laughs> yeah okay mark do you have a camera ah and... i do yeah oh well before before we go into this i mean <laughs> there, there will be our listeners i'm sure and scarlet we'll, we, we should probably have the uh the generic sort of gear question um what camera do you use what stuff do you use um lenses and all that kind of thing well i've only ever used nikon um and uh i've recently became a Nikon ambassador which is just the most exciting thing because oh, that's cool I've been very brand loyal and and um and just have always loved my Nikon um but when I became a brand ambassador is when I went mirrorless um it sort of gave me the confidence to sort of take that next step because obviously <laughs> in camera is the last ones to sort of to maybe <laughs> to do it. but um but yeah, so I now use, uh, um, I was using uh, a D810 um, and for 
concert photography uh, I use the same lenses but now I use Z series lenses so a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 on two bodies um yeah. but for events or concerts um and then portraits usually um an 85 mil lens uh but now I use so Z series Z8 and a Z9 but, nice uh, yeah and they Very are good. incredible I mean it has I was speaking so someone was messaging me earlier about you know some questions they had about the Z series or particularly the Z8 Z9 and I can honestly say that for me jumping from what I did um I have this newfound confidence that I will never miss a shot and mm. for It's huge because I used to overshoot and um, I think some of my lenses were a bit slow. Um, so especially for sort of fast action concerts and stuff, I would have to just think, right, I've just got to shoot a lot because something will be there. And that's not how you want to be. Mm. You don't mm. want to be mm. shooting for the sake of it. Whereas now it's like the focusing is so incredible that the problem is having to back up even more pictures. Well, yeah. Like a, good ones. <laughs> yeah but that's such yeah. a nice feeling such a great feeling to just have full trust in your kit that you know mm. it's not going to let you down it's, it's yeah. amazing mirrorless has definitely been a game changer it took me a while to get there and now i wish i'd done it sooner but you know it's just one of those things isn't it i guess to shoot a recording of like orchestra and that blew my mind that i was just sort of tiptoeing around and just taking lots of pictures and it was completely quiet it was yeah like, wow. yeah it's so <laughs> cool It's funny, Mark, because I was convincing you for a long time, wasn't I, to go to go mirrorless and you really weren't sure. And I was always a Nikon user like yourself, Scarlett. And then Mark did go. Mark was a Canon user and then he went mirrorless. Still am. Canon. And um, and I ended up changing from Nikon to Canon. <laughs> so yeah. I convinced Mark to go to uh, mirrorless and then ended up going for the gear that he's got went, went Canon. But it doesn't matter what you got. The Canon Nikon range is they're, they're both absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, so. Guys, thank you for listening to the show. Uh, Scarlett, ever so much, thank you ever so much for coming on. Uh, you can hear us in the usual places, uh, which are uh, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, everywhere else. Thank you to the patrons. Thank you to, uh, thanks to everyone that's been listening. And we will see you in the next show. Thank you. Thank you.